this episode, Dubus Magazine, stacking tips for the LFAQ and much more, so don't miss it. Hi guys and uh, good morning again and welcome to another visit to the G0KSC Ham Shack and Ham Radio Guy channel. Um, I'm going to cover a, a few things this morning with regards to uh, Dubus Magazine, the LFAQ and some correction tips uh, which is going to be discussed in a, a future video but before we do that if you do like the content please press the like button below. If you'd like to be reminded about the content and find us easily again press the subscribe button and hit that bell button if you would like to be notified when there's a new video being released. I'm going to try, as I mentioned before, to get a few more on here a bit more regularly, uh, hopefully at least once a week with some useful content for you for home design and build with your antennas and also some software tips and of course some interviews coming up too. We've got some great ones for you, uh, so stay tuned for that. Um, the first subject is Dubest Magazine. You would have seen in the intro there the G0KSC LFAQs on the front cover of the current version. You may not have seen Dubus Magazine before, it's not on general sale in any shops in the UK or in the, the uh, uh, US or anywhere else. It is mail order only um, and you can subscribe to that through the, uh, the page that I've got open here now. Um, if you uh, click on here you can get a free copy as well which is a download version and there's main information about what's on the channel, what's on the uh, the, um, the site and what's in each copy um, and it, it pretty much focuses on VHF and up through to microwaves and very technical topics that are covered from antennas through to um, um, transverters and, and so on uh, a lot of EME discussions too so definitely worth a look and if you like the content there then definitely worth a subscribe um, Again, it's one of those areas where I haven't added so much content as I would like over the last few years, um, but uh, want to ramp that up as well. And one of those subjects that I'm going to be covering in there is going to be correction or lack of if you're using the right um, modeling software. So that's one to, to, uh, to cover off. But in the current um, uh, magazine, I'm talking about the LFAQ and a little bit more detail on stacking and feeding um, the arrangements. It's fairly simple when we've got a, a single antenna, but once they're stacked, um, either vertically or, or horizontally, feeding the the stacked array uh, or the individual antennas in that array in different places can have some very good effects. The most simple one is when you're stacking one above the other, if you feed the top antenna at the bottom of the loop and the bottom antenna at the top of the loop, then that leads to pattern symmetry in the horizontal plane which you don't get with a quad um, normally. Um, it also means uh, that you get um, some very hard and fast front to side uh, ratio. It, it's very very suppressed. And of course thirdly the coax lengths that's required to feed or join the two antennas together is drastically reduced. So that's really something to, uh, to look at and have an experiment with. I've also covered one of the other subjects in there is, is when they're vert vertically polarized which mechanically is a little bit more difficult to do with the twin booms. With the twin booms one above the other <coughs> they're horizontally polarized and easy to mount. When you switch them over to though the booms are side by side the, the quad would then be uh, vertically polarized and that's much more difficult to uh, to mount the antennas of course but if you then feed them offset one on one side uh, and one on the other so one of the quads fed on the left hand side one of the quads fed on the right hand side then there's a, a very interesting property that results you get a down tilt to the forward lobe rather than an upwards tilt and also a very high suppression of all the lobes directly below the antenna so ideal for a commercial installation on top of a building or something like that where you need to capture the the near field and not just the far field so some real interesting points that are discussed in that so definitely worth a look and a subscribe um, one of the other aspects on this is um, or, or which I'm going to cover in Dubas I should say is that of correction um, and for many many years we've been using the percentage based correction to give us uh, our results and get our antennas close to where we want them to be. 
The problem is with that is that may give us an acceptable or, or um, very good looking SWR, but it doesn't replicate the antenna exactly to what we saw in, uh, in the software model. So why is that important? In today's uh, modern environments, we are looking for very low noise antennas. You know, we've got things like the VE7BQH list that shows you a comparison between um, uh, a wealth of different Yagis now, albeit that it's only a comparison at a 30 angle of 30 degrees, but it compares, it's a, it's a means of comparison between the effects that those antennas at that angle in a stack of four uh, would see um, with regards to uh, noise beneath the antenna. Uh, and the signal to noise ratio, if you like, between the desired signal and any other noise or signal in any other direction. So when you deviate from the model, um, you can't necessarily see that in the real world unless you have some very sophisticated and very expensive equipment. Um, but of course, if, you, if you're seeing a, a reasonable SWR, you just may think that things are okay and as they should be. Well. If you put it to, to put it into perspective, and I'm going to put a, a, a diagram up here for you to see, if you were to um, take a 70 SEMS Yagi where the reflector is 340 millimeters and the final director is 240 millimeters, and for the given boom diameter that you're using on that, you have a correction of say six millimeters. Now. That six millimeters of corrected size being added to the reflector at 340 millimeters, now 346, is going to be far greater in terms of percentage on that 240 millimeter director right at the front. So what you have is you have a, a, a scenario where each element is effectively getting longer than the model the further you run out on the antenna. And ironically, the further you run out on the antenna, the adjustments to those elements have less and less effect directly on SWR. So you wouldn't see necessarily that you're blowing um, the, uh, the, the pattern that you had in model. So percentage is very important. So why hasn't this been seen? Why hasn't it been um, you know, brought up before perhaps? Well, SM5BSZ did um, produce a document a, a very long time ago and also some DOS based um, uh, analysis tools that would give you this percentage based correction. But it, it didn't translate well to modern methods and modern software. For instance, when I uh, tried that correction, whilst it was much closer to the modeled SWR curve, it was much further downbound. It, it worked out to around a millimeter or so out uh, to where it would need to be. Now, that doesn't mean that the analysis was wrong, it was just that perhaps with the software that was being used at the time, the segmentation density that was being used um, was different and therefore the antenna finished up in a very different position. So as you can see from the diagram, um, that's effectively adding length to all those elements. But there's also some other caveats as well. Because of course with the first and last element in the array, they only have boom on one side. So the actual percentage required, a percentage of correction required on that first and last element is much less than what it is on the other um, elements within the model as well. And then where it becomes really interesting is when you go through boom and insulated. Because if you've got through boom and electrically connected, there's one figure that would apply. But when you're going through boom and the elements are insulated from the boom, there's a number of other factors that come into play with regards to this correction. The first is the diameter of the hole that you're drilling in the boom, because this denotes how far away the element is from any other metallic structure. The second is the thickness, the wall thickness of the boom, because if it was a very thick wall, it's going to have more effect than what it would if it was a very thin wall. And the third is the insulator material that's used, because of course if it's, a, if it's got carbon in it or something like that, this is polycarbonate, then that's going to have an impact on the overall size that the antenna needs to be or each element. And finally, the depth of that insulator, how far it runs along the element, because any contact with the element is going to have a, uh, an impact. 
and the further out you are, you move from the center of the element, the more there is that's required in terms of correction. So I think this is really one of the answers to the questions that I posed earlier, in that if you, you know, why hasn't this been seen before? I think that's because on two meters, on the two meter band, um, the booms that we're using are generally uh, relatively small in, in terms of diameter, uh, and the antennas are not ne uh, necessarily going too long. And it, it, it's as that boom diameter starts to increase that those errors from the fixed correction start to really show themselves. And where that becomes really amplified is when you move to 70 sems. And I think this is one of the reasons why you don't see super long Yagis with very large diameter booms on 70 sems, because in the past, no one's been able to get them to work. This is one of the benefits of using something like uh, ANSYS HFSS, which is modeling the booms, um, the, uh, the coax, the size of the hole in the boom, the, the material that's used in the insulator, the depths of the insulator, as you can see in the uh, the uh, pictures here from um, an LFA Yagi model that's been um, optimized and developed with all of those aspects taken into account in the model. So what I'm working on, which is, is proving very difficult, it's not so bad, as I said, for elements electrically connected to the boom, because that's fairly simple and it's a it's a one-stop shop but the insulated elements or boom insulated elements is much more difficult to give an overall final uh, correction because um, of the the fact that there's just so many variants the other issue of course is that of segmentation density one of the issue you have with most of the common software products we use for modeling antennas uh, in respect of amateur radio is the variation of segments and the variation of segments makes a difference to where the antenna finally sits and how you can experiment and see the the, the differences with that if you just took a, an OWA Yagi say one of POPs YU70F um, and you run with say 10 segments per um, half wavelength and then you change that to 20 segments per half wavelength you'll see the impedance changes see the um, the first director is the controller of impedance. So, you know, which one is right? Is it the last one or the first one or the last one? Secondly, if you also take different models, one with a very thin wire and one with a very thick wire, say 12 millimeters to 4 millimeters, you'll see a, a much greater variance in the thicker wire element when you change the segmentation density to what you do with the smaller um, element. There's two reasons for that also. One is that easy neck and mini neck based um, products all use a thin wire kernel. So once you're getting up to 70 sems, starting to hit home on two meters, but once you get up to 70 sems, that thin wire kernel accuracy is starting to be pushed when you get up to a, a up and above 10 millimeter diameter. But also for accuracy, that segmentation density needs to change as well. So the ideal, really when you, you're doing anything like this to be able to establish um, a, a model and a correction for your environment is to build a small antenna um, using the material that you uh, wish to do uh, or wish to use and then check it and what I did and you'll see in the photos here is built a three element on a one and a half or three element for two meters on a one and a half inch diameter boom with insulators and then a five element um, and the reason for doing that is, as I mentioned earlier, you, you, the first and last element where there's only boom on one side are going to be less correction or going to have less correction than what elements would do in the middle of a boom where there's lots of boom on each side. So you can then check the differences between what you get from that data um, to an ab establish a good level of correction. And you can get fairly close on two meters and it's the two meter uh, percentage based correction that I'm going to release in in Dubus first but as you've probably already got an indication from from the very few minutes that I've been trying to give this very holistic and high level overview of where this correction would be that it's a fairly complicated subject so it's probably going to be one that's going to have to cover uh, over a number of different issues so that's it look out for that in Dubus I will have of course uh, more information on that post uh, the magazine update uh, on here and on g0ksc.co.uk too 
um, and hope to see you next time. Don't forget, uh, click, like and subscribe. Cheers for now.